Okay, so we ended this morning by saying that uh, the purpose of business should be to solve the problems of people and planet profitably, and this sort of approach uh, that forms the basis of the economics of mutuality is a way in which one can achieve that outcome, and that it's important that one focuses on the purpose of business and the mechanism by which that purpose can be delivered. Now, it's become all the more important because of this. And that is, 40 years ago, 85% of the assets of the SMP 500 companies where tangible assets, buildings, plant, machinery, etc. Today, 85% of the assets of the S&P 500 companies are intangible assets. And in addition, as this slide here shows, the millennium was a turning point in the UK when for the first time investment in intangible assets equaled and then accelerated ahead of investment in tangible assets. And you'll see from that part in blue that during the financial crisis, investment in intangible assets actually kept up better than investment in tangible assets. And I'll come back to that in just a minute. The US, it's much the same story, that the millennium was the point at which investment in intangible assets first equaled that intangible assets. And as this slide should show, that investment in intangible assets in the United States during the financial crisis was the point at which it increased substantially beyond investment in tangible assets. Now, some of that growth in tangible, intangible assets is what we've been talking about, namely investment in human capital and social capital. And it's indicative of the growing importance of those types of assets to companies. But it's going to be made even more significant going forward because we've seen nothing yet in terms of what's happening. There is the contribution that's coming from technology in terms of creating social networks, that's making social capital not only an input into companies, but an output, a purpose that has a social orientation to it. And it's the start of the process, which will accelerate with automation, machine learning, artificial intelligence, etc. The potential the technology to transform our lives for the better is phenomenal. But likewise, the potential for technology to create real damage to our societies is equally great. And that makes the nature of the business model going forward of particular significance. And in addressing that, what we need to recognize is that to establish the outcomes that we're looking for from business in the future, we need to recognize how we can actually establish the benefits associated with those technological improvements in a mutual fashion. One area that illustrates that extremely well is in relation to the future of work. Because while that automation, artificial intelligence, will benefit us immensely as consumers, it likewise threatens our livelihoods and our employment. And the question that we're going to be addressing during the course of this afternoon is, thinking about mutuality in the context of the fourth industrial revolution, the technological changes that are yet to happen makes mutuality 
of particular relevance and raises the question of how does the economics of mutuality help us to think about precisely those sorts of conflicts that technology is likely to pose in the future. We started this morning by highlighting two changes. The change of scarcities and the size of multinational corporations. I wish to add now a third one, which was not uh, something we identified 15 years ago, and which is essentially the shift from the service economy to the knowledge economy. The service economy relied primarily on financial capital, banks, insurance. And now we're moving into the digital economy, the, the knowledge economy, which actually relies primarily on digital, on technologies that connect people. And whereas uh, the, finance, the uh, service economy was financial capital intensive, the knowledge economy will be social capital and human capital intensive. And I'd like to share one anecdote coming from our own story at Mars. Several years ago, we acquired Wrigley for $23 billion. And it was a company made of uh, hundreds of, of, uh, of factories, 40,000 people, multi-billion brands. At the same time, WhatsApp, a small startup, that actually was not even making money, was acquired for $19 billion. You could argue that actually the economic system is not working, but nevertheless, that was a strong signal that the value in the future is no longer in the financial assets or in the material assets. It is in this intangible that we call social capital and human capital. And any business actually that is moving into the knowledge economy is going to do exactly the same as the one operating in the traditional economy. They can either create value or destroy value. They can either create social and human capital or they can destroy it. And this is a challenge, in my view, for the years to come. And we had the great, great pleasure today to have one uh, senior executive from one of these leading companies, Google. And it is really a great, great pleasure to hear the future of work and the future economy from the lens of someone who actually was working in that topic. Thank you. So now it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Halverian. Professor Varian serves the chief economist at Google, where he advises on a range of issues. However, as one of my collaborators reminded me, many of us first came across his name on the cover of their microeconomics textbook. <laughs> so I'd like to welcome Professor Halvarian. Thank you very much for that nice uh, introduction. It's a great pleasure to be here at Oxford. I spent uh, a year as a visiting fellow at Nuffield back in the 90s and had just a fantastic time. Got a lot of work done before there was even a SAID school in existence, uh, but uh, Oxford has only gotten better since then. So, Anyway, I want to talk about uh, this uh, work automation demography. I had a very pretentious title originally, <laughs> Automation and Procreation, but I decided it was better to make a more informal title, namely, Bots and Tots, okay? <laughs> because I want to talk about the integration of both the bot side and the demographic side. Here's the Econ 101 uh, picture of the labor market with a demand curve, a supply curve, right out of the textbook, I might add. And uh, of course, we know that technology is increasing rapidly. We know there are lots of new technologies, technologies becoming available. And so we'll think that will reduce the demand for labor. And there have been many articles on this, starting with the seminal work of Freya and Osborne right here at uh, Oxford, at the Martin School. So, um, but there's another effect going on that hasn't received nearly as much attention 
And that's the supply curve of labor because we're seeing the supply of labor, the labor force, is being reduced for demographic uh, reasons. So essentially, the baby boom is the, one of the biggest effects. And uh, what does that mean? Well, we're going to see less labor in the future. I think that's pretty clear from the diagram. We don't quite know what, what's going to happen to wages. It depends on whether the bots or the tots are the uh, biggest shift. And so what I want to do today is explore both sides of that demand and supply equation for um, maybe 15, 20 minutes and uh, give you some ideas that you can think about, uh, about what the new world might, uh, might look like. So we'll start with the bots. Seen a lot of stories about robots stealing your job, and a robot is after your job. They bid for big jobs in outer space back in 1960. In 1935, there were the thinking machines replacing the thinkers, and we go a little further back, 1812, <clears throat> we've got a lot of anxiety there connected with automation in the mills. So this issue, this fear of automation has been around for a long time, but just recently we started to see headlines that look like this, America's growing labor shortage, construction, agriculture, truck driving, forklift drivers, dairy farms, meat packing, many, many uh, jobs are going vacant because they haven't been able to find the workers to do it. Now, Part of that is cyclical, of course. We are coming out of a long period of slow growth. Growth is increasing pretty much in the, all the developed world. But um, part of it, I maintain, is, is really a long-run issue. That is the demographics I referred to a few minutes ago. Now, the economy can absorb shocks to the labor market. And in the, in the last uh, 50 years, we've seen two really big shocks to the labor market. One was women entering the labor force. If you go back uh, 1945, 1950, uh, the uh, women were about half uh, of the uh, number of men employed. And now when we fast forward to 2015, it's more like 85 or uh, eight, uh, almost 90%. So we've seen a big shock in terms of new workers coming on board. And of course, that's been a very positive thing. Incomes have gone up, employment's gone up. It's been quite uh, good for the economy, of course, to have those uh, additional workers. And then the other factor was baby boomers. So we look at the few babies were produced during the, uh, during the Depression and during World War II. Then along comes the baby boom afterwards, the baby bust. 20 years later, you get the echo of the baby boom as the, as the baby boomers' children start having children, and so on and so on and so on. And that was a very large impact as well. And both of these effects really peaked around the 60s and 70s when we saw a big influx of baby boomers and women into the labor market. Uh, we've seen things happen on the other side, the so-called spreadsheet apocalypse, when lots of people who are doing simple-minded bookkeeping, accounting, and auditing lost their jobs, but at the same time, accountants, auditors, management, analysts, and so on, increase the employment rate. So you've had a substitution for low-skilled workers into uh, high-skilled workers. So this one, I particularly like. The Bureau of Labor Statistics still tracks video rental clerks, <laughs> even though they've essentially entirely, uh, entirely disappeared, except in a few isolated places. And it, it is remarkable. That profession grew and then very quickly uh, declined, and the labor force pretty much uh, dealt with that. So I think what we need to think about when we're talking about future of work, we want to make this the distinctions between jobs and tasks. So you think about automation doesn't typically eliminate entire jobs, it will eliminate the dull, tedious, and repetitive tasks that are associated with those jobs. So there could be manual tasks like washing clothes, drying dishes, mowing lawns, digging holes, all that kind of thing, which you've automated to a large degree. And then cognitive tasks, like making change for a purchase or memorizing maps and so on. And when you eliminate all the tasks associated with a job, well, then you've eliminated the job. But that's fairly rare. In fact, if you look back at 1950 in the US, there were 270 occupations that people were classified into in the 1950 census. And only one of those has actually been eliminated by automation, and that is an elevator operator. 
Now, many of you are probably too young to even remember this occupation, but they're manually operated elevators. You'd go in, chat with the person, and they would take you to where you want. But they didn't just move the elevator. They also were a safety monitor, a security monitor, a greeter, provided answers to questions, directions, services to residents, special prices and offers. All these different tasks were associated with being an uh, elevator operator. And those tasks are still there. So you go into a big building in London, and there'll be a security person, and there'll be a person maybe who welcomes you or who answers questions or guides you where you need to go, a receptionist. And indeed, this is the norm that most jobs are a lot more complicated than we think. Even what we call low-skilled jobs actually require a lot of skills. And if you look at ONET, which is this wonderful site maintained by the Department of Labor in the US, they took the 2,000 or so jobs that they have listed, and they look at all the tasks associated with that job. So it's quite interesting to uh, browse that site. These are the tasks associated with being a groundskeeper or, or a landscaper or a, garden, a gardener. And you can see they're quite varied. There are many different tasks associated with it. And this is only the first page, then there's the second page and the third page, and it goes on and on and on. Lots and lots of different tasks. And if you show this to somebody who specializes in robotics, they say, yes, indeed, I could build a robot that would uh, decorate gardens with stones and plants, let's say, just to choose one of the tasks. I just need $10 billion and 10 years of research to do that. Because you, what you want to do is to do all the tasks, all of these 60 or so tasks that are listed, uh, you really, uh, it would really be quite an undertaking. Not saying we'll never get there, but I'm just saying that it's really more complicated than people think because jobs encompass a multitude of tasks, even low-skilled jobs. And it's not only groundskeeper, uh, well, this is a point I just uh, made. And when you look at where robots have made a lot of uh, incursion into work, it's in automobile factories. That's the number one place where robots are employed. Second biggest uh, employment area is with uh, consumer electronics. And if you think about it, we've been optimizing the assembly line for 100 years. Go back to 1909 when Henry Ford was building an assembly line in uh, Detroit, Michigan. They were tuning everything so that you could have a human doing one thing at one place in that line repetitively. And uh, once you've managed to optimize to that degree, then it's not too surprising that you can put a machine into that job. Now, a heterogeneous environment where you have, a, have to have a lot of different skills, that's much, much more difficult, even when the tasks are relatively simple. Generally, we've seen that machines have augmented human performance rather than uh, entirely replaced it. This is the ideal environment if you have a groundskeeping <laughs> robot. By the way, that's local. That's the All Souls uh, uh, lawn there. And I thought they have two gardeners that actually maintain all of the uh, grounds there. Same thing with a hotel housekeeper. Not something we think of as a skilled occupation, but then you really sit down and think every room is different. There are different challenges in each room. Cleaning the hotel room, replenishing supplies, dust and polishing the furniture goes on and on. There's also three pages of this. So it's also a complex job to automate, although you could certainly imagine automating some of those tasks to making the job easier to do and more pleasant, uh, more pleasant occupation. And there's my ideal environment <laughs> for a housekeeper robot. I thought that looked pretty inviting as well. If every, if every hotel room in the entire world were the same, then it would be a lot easier to, uh, to automate that occupation. And so you might ask yourself, well, uh, what tasks can be automated? And how would tasks be associated with jobs? And there's a lot of different answers for that. So here we see the Fry and Osborne report, really the set, I would say a seminal study that set off a lot of this work, uh, used that ONET data and argued that it was a quite high fraction of the jobs and tasks would be automated. And other people, Price Waterhouse, Coopers, the OECD, ITF, Forrester, McKenzie, lots of other views there. So there's a wide variety of views. And I think that's to be expected because it's very, very hard to know what technology will look like in 10 years or 20 years. And 
just as a little preview of coming attractions, it's hard to forecast technology. It's far, far easier to forecast demography. Okay, and we'll see what happens when we get to that uh, section of the talk. Ten largest occupations in the U.S. All of these pay less than the medium wage. Sales, by the way, it's almost, it's a very similar list for the U.K. Food preparation, general office clerk, RN, uh, customer service representative, and so on. Most of these jobs are in services. That's 80% of private U.S. employment. These ten jobs, just these occupations here, count for 21% of total employment. Kind of amazing. And the only one that pays more than the median wage is, is a nurse. And nurses are getting paid, uh, paid in the $70,000, $80,000 uh, range. Food service workers, di excuse me, dishwashers, is one of the lowest paid occupations, around 20000 a year. So the question would be, we would want to look at these jobs and think about what tasks associated with those jobs would be automated and which one wouldn't. So for example, nowadays McDonald's is putting all of these kiosks so you fill in the order yourself so the person who actually takes the order is not in the loop. Uh, it's the people who cook it and serve it. But even that can be automated to some degree. So I think we'll, see, we'll, we'll clearly see this kind of thing uh, happening because you've created something that's very homogeneous. Now, the first invasion of the machines, I like to think of, is occurring back in 1880, where we had all of this innovation in domestic production. Washing machines, dryers, dishwashers, vacuum cleaners, lawnmowers, sewing machines, on and on and on. And in fact, it is the creation of those domestic appliances that enabled women to enter the labor market uh, later because they were uh, so important in terms of freeing up time for paid labor rather than the unpaid labor that was uh, part of housework for thousands of years, really. Uh, there's a few exceptions to this. So you, there's, here's, a, uh, here's a robot that does get around by uh, walking. Uh, OK, now, another important consideration in thinking about how this automation is going to affect employment is the work week. Because if you look at the data, back in 1850, we were working 66 hours a week. If you go a little earlier, back to 1800, it was almost 70 hours a week. If you're working on a farm, the cows, the sheep, they don't respect the uh, work week, really. And uh, it was a very, very uh, time-consuming and unpleasant work. If we fast forward to 1955, 1960, we're down to about 38 hours per work, but there's a great deal of variation across countries. This is from an OECD um, paper, where in the Netherlands, the average work week is 29.1 hours. It's amazing, 29 hours, a whole hour less than we work here or uh, in the UK or in the US, for that matter. Uh, and they do that because they've constructed a set of government institutions and a set of services that make part-time work easy to do, okay? Very, very interesting case. There's no particular reason why we couldn't do that elsewhere. Uh, if you think about just the policy changes would be necessary, but also if we become substantially more productive, if productivity increases by 25%, then you can accomplish in four days what previously took five days. So. That's certainly not, uh, not out of the question, at least uh, in the next uh, couple of decades. So what is it that people want? I claim they want more jobs and less work. But ideally, ideally, that's what technology can deliver. Uh, everybody loves a three-day weekend, so there's no reason why a three-day weekend couldn't be permanent. After all, if you look at the uh, figures I just showed you, you can you can have a 30-hour work week, even with today's uh, technology. So why not make it permanent? Now, when you talk about this business of the future of work, there, you always have to confront or deal with this idea of education and training. Uh, if you look at the kinds of jobs that have grown and the kinds of jobs that have not, if we look at routine cognitive or routine manual labor, where you're doing the same thing over and over again, We've seen very little growth in that. Those are the middle two lines, the red and the green. But when we look at non-routine cognitive and non-routine manual, both of those have grown 
uh, significantly. So you think about being a gardener, it is actually a non-routine manual work because you have to deal with lots of different uh, environments. Uh, people say that you know, it's a good job to be an auto worker and it's a bad job to be a gardener, but I don't know, lots of people do gardening for a hobby and nobody does auto work for a hobby. So. <laughs> nobody works an assembly line just for the fun of it. So it's a difference in salary that's there, not the characteristics of the job itself. And that's just a chart showing unemployment rates and earnings by educational attainment. So I'm sure everybody in this room recognizes that education is really good from an economic point of view. Lower unemployment, higher earnings go along with more education. But even though it's good for any individual to become more educated, it doesn't mean it's necessarily good for everyone to become more educated because who will do the jobs that don't require much education? Maybe it's immigrants, maybe it's robots. There's lots of different ways to address that question. But I would say, given the, the, the pages I showed you before from ONET, there's still going to be jobs for groundkeepers and housemaids because those are jobs that people uh, want to have done. Now, the best way to acquire job skills, as we know, is on the job because there's less opportunity cost. Anytime you have to quit your job to go uh, acquire education or not work to acquire education, that's going to be very costly and prohibitive for many people. The jobs, on-the-job learning is more relevant, more focused, people are more highly motivated. And so I think the real task is how can we make it easier to acquire education and training uh, on the job? Oops, wrong direction. Not only can technology deliver on the job skills, it already does. So here's uh, my little example from YouTube, every day there are 500 million, half a billion views on YouTube of how-to videos. And I'll bet you everybody in this audience has accessed one or the other of these. There's a whole bunch that have to do with cognitive things, how to do trigonometry and calculus and differential equations and recursion algorithms, all that stuff. This is an example from Khan Academy. But more importantly, I think, there's a lot of stuff about how to acquire manual skills, like how do I replace the flapper on my toilet? I had to look that up a while ago. Or how do you bake a souffle? That's a job-related task. How do you weld? How do you uh, remove a strip bolt? How do you clean glass pipe? How to solder copper pipe? On and on and on. These go on, again, hundreds of thousands of videos are available there. And if you think about it, this is really the first time in human society that we have this ubiquitous material for education and training available to anyone in the world on a friendly, accessible device for free, okay? So to me, this has got to be a huge plus that people can acquire this just-in-time learning or they can acquire the training that they need to do their jobs using this kind of, uh, of access point. And one of the things we're working on at YouTube is trying to organize this better, catalog, review it, uh, encourage people to produce it, on and on and on. So there's a lot of material that's there. It's not providing the raw material that's important, but it's in making it uh, more useful to people or more accessible. Now, it used to be that being a cashier required knowing how to make change. Well, that's irrelevant. It used to be to be a taxi driver, you had to know city streets, also irrelevant. A hospitality worker, you might want to know a bit of foreign languages. Uh, if you're a gardener, you need to recognize plants. Well, all of those skills are no longer barriers to working in these professions because you certainly don't have to know arithmetic anymore to be a cashier. Navigating around town, that's been taken over by geopositioning systems and mobile phones. Now we have a service at Google, Google Lens. You can take a picture of a plant, press the button, and it will tell you what plant that is, and click again, and you can see how much water it needs, how much sun it needs, uh, what kind of fertilizer and care it needs, and so on. So all of that knowledge, the cognitive part of being a gardener can be replaced making it easier to become a gardener, right? It's making it easier for people to get these jobs because they inquire the education uh, on the job or directly prior to the job. And of course, as you 
uh, work as a gardener or as a veterinarian or as a taxi driver, you learn these things yourself because they're incorporated into your, uh, into your uh, knowledge, even though you've learned it by using this mechanical device, mobile phone. So, summary. Well, there's my summary slides on bots. Demand for labor, supply of labor, important. Automation, you really should think in terms of tasks. Job training, ideally on the job, and technology can and is helping in terms of delivering that training on an as-needed basis. So let me turn now to the tots. There's a tot. Productivity. This is an economic concept. The output per person is output per hour times hours per worker times workers per person. I'm not going to derive that equation for you. And uh, economists, we call that productivity, employment, and participation. Well, employment is pretty much full. Participation is declining. And productivity growth is pretty anemic. Okay. By the way, here are the slides. They didn't quite transfer right. We transferred the slides from PDF to, uh, to PowerPoint, and uh, something went a little wrong there. Anyway, the, uh, so the question is, if employment is going to stay full and participation is going down, then really it's only, output, uh, it's only the uh, productivity that can increase the output per worker. And when we go look at the data, we see this period of slow productivity growth from the 70s up to the 90s, rapid productivity growth uh, after that for about a decade, but now it's gone back to being slow productivity growth again, which is concerning a lot of, uh, a lot of economists, and particularly for demographic reasons, which I'm going to describe next. This is what the growth of the labor force looked like in the US uh, by decade, and notice that the 2020s, the decade we're entering next, is the lowest growth in the labor force ever, okay? The lowest growth ever. And even then, in the 2030s and 2040s, it's not going to be very high. It's about the same rate it is now. And up there is the chart of the baby boomers. I showed you that before. But look here, the chart on the left is population, and the chart on the right is labor force. And you can see, just by eyeballing that, that the uh, labor force is growing about half the rate of the population. Okay, All of those baby boomers who are retiring expect to continue to consume. Reasonable request, you would think. But that means there must be sufficient people to produce the products that those uh, baby boomers are going to consume. And the only way you can increase the productivity of those uh, workers is, in fact, to engage in various kinds of uh, automation. Labor shortage, this may not be as meaningful to you, but the Labor shortage is basically differs quite dramatically with, uh, with geography. Essentially, the northern US, uh, we're seeing the young people leaving, and they're going to the south, to Texas, to uh, Nevada, to Utah, Florida, Georgia, these other places. So you're seeing a division within the country where you have older retired people, not enough workers to really keep everything going, and then you look in the south, and you're seeing a lot of young uh, workers. So this is a, and you have a similar problem, of course, if you think about what's happened, the difference between the north and south of, uh, of uh, England. Without immigration in the U.S., you would see the labor force decline, okay, an absolute decline. Now, we, and by that I mean the U.S. and the U.K., we're in good shape compared to many countries. Oh, here's the participation going down uh, as well. We're in good shape in many countries. If you look at um, around the world, there's a huge demographic problem in Korea, Japan, Germany, Italy, Austria, Spain, on and on and on, a very big gap between the working age population and the retired population. Again, for the reasons I described a few minutes ago. And if you want that non-working population to have sufficient consumption, then there really has to be uh, some improvement in productivity. Uh, this is what the growth in the population, the labor force look like. Look at 2010. 18% growth in the population over the decade, only 7% growth in the labor force, and things really don't, don't get back in line until 2050. It's kind of remarkable. This whole thing was caused to a large degree by World War II, 
and it's going to take 100 years to get the do demography back aligned again uh, so that the population, the labor force, are growing at the same rate, which I think is quite uh, remarkable. Oh, oh, and guess what? The countries that have the worst demographic, demographic problems, in fact, are investing most heavily in automation. So if you look at Korea, Japan, Germany, Italy, and so on and so on, you're seeing this investment occur in exactly those countries. And the prime example is the Chinese. The Chinese had the one-child policy. One-child policy was a disaster in terms of the demographic impact because they're going to have way too few workers to support that aging uh, population. So they are investing heavily in robotics, artificial intelligence, and other forms of automation just to meet that challenge that they'll face uh, coming down the road. And I think I, oh, I didn't uh, have a chance to add the, uh, this slide. The birth rate, the, the birth rate in the US is lower than it's been in 100 years. It actually hit the minimum. Story in the Wall Street Journal just, uh, just uh, yesterday. It takes 20 years to raise a 20-year-old. <laughs> Pretty much a universal constant. And so the question is, you can't immediately replace these workers through demographic forces. What it means is automation or immigration, of course, is another uh, issue. Vending machines. It's funny now you're seeing all of this concern about retail robots. Well, we've had retail robots for 50 years. Uh, in Japan, they've had one machine for every 23 people here. In the US, it was about one machine for 45 people. Black death. I don't know, I should just mention this in passing. Black Death, <clears throat> it was a great time to be alive if you were alive. <laughs> because if you look at it, you saw this 30% decline in the population, dramatic increase in wage, feudalism disappeared, came back later, but it disappeared for uh, several decades, and land was available, wages, and so on and so on. So this is what happens when you have a labor-scarce economy. Don't want to get it by Black Death, but it's, coming, it's arriving by the, uh, by the uh, natural forces of demographics. And uh, which is a bigger effect, this is a little back, uh, uh, back of the envelope calculation. I compared this, uh, the effect of shifting the supply curve, about 2.7% change in the employment to population ratio due to the demographic effects. It's about 1.76% change in the uh, employment to population ratio due to the automation. That's, of course, a guess. That's speculation from this uh, Boston consulting group. But the demographic effect is big, OK? It's big. It's about 50% larger than the automation effect, at least uh, during the next uh, decade or so. And it's much harder to see further out than that. And also, here's the, here's the last slide, which is kind of depressing. The population, as it ages, it becomes more costly. Okay, because of medical, medical treatment of one sort. Um, you have this uh, problem with uh, aging, Alzheimer's disease, all of these kinds of uh, things. So it becomes more expensive as people age. And this is showing up in all the current uh, occupation data. The um, Department of Labor released a study about what occupations would be in the largest demand and a newspaper headline writer summarized it by saying, nerds and nurses. <clears throat> and if you look here, personal health care aides, registered nurses, whoops, lost it. Registered nurses, home health care aides, medical assistants, software developers, well, there it is. I mean, the nerds and nurses isn't such a bad uh, summary. So last statement. Do I have a summary here? No, the end. Uh, point is. <laughs> The point is that when we look at the labor market, we want to look at both sides. We want to try to forecast as, well, as best we can how the demand for labor will change as technology advances. But even more importantly, we want to look at how that interacts with the demographic effects as well, because both are going to be important, bots and tots. So that's the end. Thanks. <clears throat>
Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much, Hal, for an incredibly fascinating speech on the future of work. Now, when we were asked to provide the student response to Hal's uh, speech on the future of work, it was quite intimidating, and it is quite intimidating. I mean, when the chief economist at Google says what is going to happen in the future, it's kind of, they write the future. So what do Alec and I have to add to that? However, once we started to dissect some of the actual implications of what the future of work is going to look like, there are a few things that we started to feel a little bit more unsettled about. We agree with the general verdict that technology should play an important role in the development of the workplace. However, despite that, there were two concerns that we're going to talk about today. First, we wonder if this focus on technological efficiency is really the best and only answer to the problems that society is facing today. Secondly, if we do choose technology as the right path, what is going to be the implication on the global scale in the medium term? To the first point, technology-centric visions of the world often seem to be laser-focused on efficiency, which to a certain extent makes sense. An efficient system is obviously better than an inefficient system. We all learned that in our Tech and Ops class. So it must be true. However, <laughs> should this be the sole focus of business? Efficiency is important, but only in as much as it improves our well-being. And we believe that technology should always be looked at through this lens. We can now use our smartphones to order a taxi to turn up almost instantly, have on-demand dog walkers, and outsource the buying of flowers for our wives. I haven't done the last of that. I just want to point that out. We can order almost anything and have it delivered the next day thanks to technology facilitating our daily consumption decisions. Yet, are these inventions what we really think of when we think of progress, when we think of development? When you just think of how many billions of dollars is currently being spent just to get you that product a little bit quicker today than you could have got it last year. It is precisely this focus on efficiency and not societal well-being that has given rise to the gig economy, which has created an entire workforce without rights, questionable work hour flexibility, and no long-term career development. For example, in the next 10 years, we will likely face the societal implications of moving from physical driver cars to driverless cars. However, what happens to the millions of people around the world, or even just the thousands that work for Uber, they're going to be impacted by this. It is going to be a huge, there are going to be huge societal implications. Prior to this MBI, I lived in Peru. And unlike here in the UK, where Uber was introduced, it was a great thing. It actually increased the average wage from what a taxi driver could typically earn. However, after a year or so, once people had invested their life savings in buying a new car to be a driver and actually classify for being able to drive for Uber, Uber dropped the rates drastically, as I've heard a standard practice when it enters a new market. And therefore, taxi driver income fell drastically as well. Now, did these taxi drivers have the opportunity to retrain and pivot into something else? No, they just spent all of their resources on buying a new taxi. And they were now left with an asset that had no intrinsic value outside of what was now not a particularly well-paying job. What is to happen when Uber shifts into driverless cars? Will Uber invest to manage and retrain its informal labor force of gig economy drivers into Uber fleet operators or data analysts? What incentive does Uber currently have to factor this cost into its business plan? I would argue none at the moment. On the other hand, mining companies, when they do set out to do a mine, they actually do need to incorporate what would be the environmental restoration costs when they close that, down, that mine down at the end. They need to take that into consideration with the project financing. So why do technology companies not need to factor in societal costs and retraining when they automate or disrupt a process or a sector? These are costs that societies ultimately pick up. You just need to look to economically disadvantaged places in the UK, France, the US, countless other countries to see what happens when this isn't managed correctly. Coming back to Hal's point on the aging demographics we are facing, the technology answer to that the efficiency-centric answer to that is to automate elderly care and improve the capacity for robots to provide services. Whereas the non-technologist's answer to that 
the traditional way of dealing with that is to care for the elderly within their community and family. One is clearly more efficient, the former, but well-being is clearly higher in the latter. And technology companies need to understand that balancing these two factors when designing products for the future is the key to being successful. So to follow uh, from Patrick's point on demographics, I'm interested in the impact of automation at a global scale. Howe's excellent presentation has given us a fascinating view on automation's role in overcoming the demographic challenges that many countries face. Personally, I'm feeling pretty happy about hearing that we'll see more jobs and less work. I think many of my classmates will join me in that. I wonder, however, if the need for automation is relevant everywhere. And if it is, will it be inclusive and evenly distributed? What are the countries that do not have the same demographic pressures and actually have growing labor markets, uh, growing labor forces, and still developing economies? Could automation have a less rosy or even adverse impact on their economies? I wonder if technology, if not managed properly, risks exacerbating the existing inequalities in society that we see across the world. On one side, it is clear that many countries in the developed world will need labor solutions to counter demographic shifts. We've seen how people are getting older, living older, and immigration is not providing a balance to that. Robots, objectively, seem like a great idea. They can automate the boring and borderline dangerous tasks, free up workers for more complex jobs, and help us become more productive in our day-to-day -day lives. Just looking at the healthcare sector alone, the opportunities are tremendous. Imagine a redesigned hospital where simple tasks like patient registration and blood tests are automated and the experience of a hospital or visiting a hospital uh, will be completely streamlined. Technology can also create solutions to healthcare problems, not just increase efficiency of processes. Just this week, our class discussed a startup performer, uh, MBA students from Oxford, looking at virtual reality treatment in dementia. Technology developments are exciting prospects because of their potential impact and their potential scale. But I wonder how precisely they will scale and with what impact. What are the countries and regions that do not have aging populations that instead have young, dynamic, and growing labor forces and still developing economies? Nigeria, for example, has a median age of 18 and the Philippines of 23 and a half. I wonder what increased automation will mean for those countries. How will technological development affect their need to grow their industries and grow their jobs in line with their population growth? Even if large sections of jobs can be automated in these countries, they may not have the incentives to do so. In turn, the existence of lower wage rates across the world may actually reduce the business case for automation. Um, it might be simply cheaper to transfer an activity to a different city or region uh, than to build and maintain uh, a, a robotic manufacturing uh, facility. We have seen this example for, uh, we have seen this happen, for example, in the garment industry. Its production has historically shifted to where wages have been lower, for example, presently shifting from Bangladesh to Ethiopia. The perspective is a lot different for simpler and more repetitive tasks in agriculture and manufacturing, such as we heard about in uh, automotive manufacturing. Robotics here are already taking impact and as a consequence, changing the global mix of production and trade and in tandem, global capital flows. So will automation be able to provide more jobs and less work at a global scale? Is automation mutual? Or will it flourish in the economies that need it, leaving large disparities with countries that don't? I wonder what the knock-on effects will be on the future work if technology businesses are left unchecked. Work is ultimately one of the most important drivers of social mobility and intrinsically what much of society is structured around. Automation and technology development could be a driver or constraint to work. And this is up to the practices of our businesses and the policies of our governments to influence how this will practically play out. Thank you. Excellent, thank you. 
So now we have 10 minutes for Q&A, but I want to first give Professor Varian an uh, opportunity to respond to his responders. If you have any comments on this question of efficiency or on different demographies. Right. So, so th I think those were both excellent uh, uh, discussions, excellent points that were raised. Um, I have a longer presentation that touches <laughs> on some of them. I spared you that. But, but I think the geopolitical uh, issues are, are going to be quite interesting because there's a lot of discussion now about the competition between the developed and developing world for things like oil or things like water, or things like food. But you also have this great disparity uh, in terms of the aging population where really we're moving to a period where the developed economies are going to be much older uh, and probably less energetic. I'm extrapolating from my own case. But, <clears throat> but the uh, developing countries, of course, are getting younger. So your examples, India, Nigeria, Indonesia, all of these countries are uh, younger people, high energy, want to work and uh, want to consume. So how does the developed and de developing world interact in that, uh, in that context? I think it's, it's quite uh, an interesting uh, and important issue. Great. So now I'd like to open it up to the floor if we have any questions for Professor Varian or for the students. Yes, so just a question. Jean-Philippe Ameu from ESX School of Management. So you show the aging, yes, issue of people coming older and older, and that is an issue regarding the fact that you are consumer and less and less producers. So we have an issue regarding productivity, as you said, and robots and uh, automation can provide some solutions. And uh, the solutions comes also from uh, human capital, so meaning that we probably have to invest more in knowledge, in innovation, in research, in order to make sure that we increase the productivity when people are working. Because, in fact, one person who works 40 hours during, uh, per week, during 40 years, more or less is average in France, I'm from France, uh, they work 64,000 hours during their life, and they live seven 50,000 hours in their life. So 750 hours uh, living and 40, no, 64,000 uh, working time. So meaning that you work less than 9% of your life, which is not a lot. So we can also have an issue regarding the fact that we retire at that date. Maybe you could change the, the arrangement because people uh, can work maybe a longer time, as we can see in Japan, for example, but maybe it's too long. But to cut ranching on this side, so meaning human capitals, investing more, maybe working a little bit more, but people don't work, work won't work less, but uh, with economics of mutuality and taking into account uh, responsible management, we could expect that people are, yes, have a better uh, perception of their work. And finally, working less is not so beneficial, maybe, maybe if people feel better in their job. That is a question. What do you think about that? Right. A short no, question. No, I, 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 like, I like the question because I, I think there's a lot of policy responses to this issue that are relatively low cost. So look, for example, at the Netherlands as a guide. They make it much easier to do part-time work. And when you look at retirees in the US, typically they don't want to go from 40 hours to zero hours. They want to go from 40 hours to 20 hours or from 20 hours to 15 hours, they want to phase this out. But the tax structures in the US for dealing with uh, the pension, the interaction between pension and taxes are really perverse and discourage people from doing this. Whereas from the viewpoint of, of productivity, we, we want people to do this. Or, so uh, I think you could look at this uh, in many other uh, countries in the world have the same problem where they don't necessarily uh, have good incentives at retirement to work fewer hours, not zero hours. Uh, first, and, first and foremost, Professor Varian, thank you so much. Your book helped me go through economics on the graph. <laughs> All right. It's so much better than Nicholson's, I can't even compare. <laughs> But drawing from the, some of the teachings that you, you brought to us, there's something in the picture that we not consider. 
is use the debt. Some of those nations that you put that have uh, high levels of automation also have very high levels of per capita debt. They're only increasing if you take only into account the labor uh, that exists in those countries. Exactly one of those countries, I was talking to some of the people in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and they believe that the only answer to this is not automation. They pointed out that it's not enough to pay off for the debt, only increasing automation, but increasing immigration. What is your opinion? Will the economic force in these countries to increase immigration, to help with this load, and even help po the point that Alec made about in some countries, maybe automation is not good since you have a growing labor force, and will help soothe this transition to a more knowledge-based economy? Right. Well, of course, I think we all could agree that an intelligent, rational immigration policy would be quite attractive in, a, in addressing these issues. But unfortunately, we also know that topic is highly politicized and there's a great heterogeneity of views. So in a democracy, there will be some sort of compromise to deal with this issue. But I do think that um, as the population ages, as the supply of healthcare workers per person because, uh, shifts, immigration will be a more popular topic at, those, at, that, at that time. Uh, so my view is we have to be very careful about what, uh, what, what, what the timing looks like in terms of uh, trying to deal with some of these issues. You could be, have a, a premature push or you can have a delayed push and it has to be, I think, carefully orchestrated. I'll take one more question, and I'm looking for a woman. We haven't had one in speak yet. Please. Hi. Um, thank you for that. Um, I actually have a question where I very much like that, obviously, you're here um, from Google Hal, and then we have students from the business school. So I'd actually like to ask Patrick and Alec what they think with the way the world is changing and we're headed for interesting times. They find is the responsibility of companies like Google um, in this changing society, and I'd also like to ask Hal, adversely, what do you think is should be the role of educators um, and schools such as Oxford Said in this exciting time? <laughs> um, so my personal view is, um, I think what Patrick talked about Ubers is quite um, quite marking, um, and. We've got technology companies that are creating new business models that haven't really been around, new ways of working, new ways of creating jobs. Um, and the societal and economic impact of that haven't really been measured or tested. Um, so what's the future landscape of that? We've got these technology companies making a lot of money, uh, becoming influential in our economies and in our world. Uh, what can they potentially do to ensure they do that in a responsible and mutual manner? Maybe Patrick wants to add um, So I think my, my main uh, response to that would be that I think technology is, is definitely it's a force for good, but we are so focused on technology for consumption, which also goes into this kind of per capita debt that we're having. So we're almost kind of looking at technology to get us out of that issue, when actually if we focused on technology for supporting society, and going back to kind of mutual business, actually looking for a more holistic view of how society should be kind of not run, but how, society, how, how participants in society should be acting, then I think we wouldn't necessarily need to look to automation or look to robots or look to technology to kind of solve some of the issues that I think we're kind of creating for ourselves, basically. Professor yeah. Barry, on education. All right. Well, I will say this is an area that we're very focused on. We've been offering lots of funding for classes, education, teaching job-related skills, both on the hard skills and the soft skills. And we are now exploring how we can do a better job uh, with this fantastic set of edu education materials on YouTube because it really is quite remarkable that that's available and it's just kind of slipped into our lives. We all know, oh, I need to change my thermostat. YouTube must uh, have a video in that or I need to cook a new dish or paint a paint, you know, do something with my watercolor painting 
and there's an instructional video. So that's a fantastic resource, and uh, we want to make it even more useful and even more bene beneficial in the future. Great. So on that note, a big thank you to okay. Hal Varian.